Neil Jeffrey, a tall, skinny, stuttering boy who dreamed of being someone greater. In 1971, Neil arrived on the campus of Baylor University with the dreams of quarterbacking the team to a victory against the University of Texas and the first Southwest Conference Championship in 50 years. And he did. Neil Jeffrey fought his way from what I thought was uh, one of the student trainers uh, to the very next fall at our opening ball game against the University of Georgia on the road as the number one quarterback for Baylor. And I remember leaving the field and going down into the tunnel and starting up the tunnel. And I looked to my right and there's number 11 walking beside me. And I turned and looked at Neil Jeffrey and he had this big smile on his face. And I just reached over and grabbed him and I'm, I'm really kind of upset because we're down 24 to 7 and Neil's got this big smile. And I said, why are you smiling? And he said, Coach, we're going to win this football game. He said, we've got them right where we want them. And I said, we're 24 to 7, Neil. And he said, I know, Coach, but just think about this. He said, we had turnovers, we moved the football, we can move the football, and we're going to win the football game. That confidence sort of uh, penetrated that dressing room. Now, Texas 24. A little over 13 minutes remaining in the game. After a 12-yard screen to Beard, a run by Franklin to the Texas six-yard line. Kent on the reverse goes in for the touchdown. The extra point by Bubba Hicks is good, and it's now Baylor 28, Texas 24. Well, that was uh, lights out for, for Texas, and uh, there was not that much time left. And uh, we uh, went ahead uh, by uh, 10 points and uh, there's no way that they're going to beat us. Texas had, had, had dominated everybody, had won six uh, championships in a row in the conference, and just, just a, 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 how we did it, it was just special, of, of being behind, beating them, and then winning the uh, championship, and just, just uh, I think, doing something nobody thought you could do. It's just, just a wonderful lifetime memory of knowing we did it. Neil Jeffrey is a legend. He is a legend because of his life for Jesus Christ. Neil took that heart that he had for football and has given it full time for his faith. Following the call into full time ministry, Neil has given himself unreservedly to serving our Lord at Prestonwood for 25 years. His first ministry position on the Prestonwood staff was student minister. Then he moved on to adult education ministry. And for the past several years, Neil has served as associate pastor with responsibilities including pastoral care, prayer ministry, and most recently as a part of the preaching team at Prestonwood. It's amazing how insufficient and insignificant you can feel, but the fact is, you know what, we place what we got, even if it ain't much, even if it's a stuttering old quarterback who struggled all of his life, you know what, the point is, boy, give what you got, whatever it is, to Jesus. We have all been witness to Neil's incredible ability to inspire and communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. He is truly a dynamic, spirit-filled servant of God. But I'm glad that you're here. It's good to see each one. Some of you are here for your first time. How many of you first retreat, ministry at Believers Fellowship you've been to? Raise your hand way up high. Praise the Lord. Look at these hands up. And we're glad you're here. We've got a few more guys coming in tonight, some early in the morning, but to pray for their safety. Uh, but we're glad that you're here to start this first session off with us tonight, looking for great things. I don't know about you, but I've really been praying uh, this be just a, a supernatural time. I, I don't know where you are in your relationship with, with, with the Lord, and I you may not even have a relationship with the Lord. I don't know that. In fact, only you know where you are, all right, in, in reality, because we can all put on a front with each other and pretend that we're somewhere or someone that we're, we may not be. But uh, wherever you are, if you'll just get honest about that, you can, you can go somewhere from there, all right? But if you won't discover where you are, you ain't going nowhere, all right? So figure out where you are. And I just pray that uh, what, what you'll leave with during this weekend that we have here together will be a life-transforming thing, that... Uh, it's events like these that have changed the life of so many people and, and, and so many men at our retreats. Some of you can give testimony to that. It was one of these events that it was a real life transforming event for your life. And I'm praying that for every one of us, no matter where you are, 
it's easy even as a believer, as a, as a Christian, I mean, even as a preacher, to get dull and dry in your, in your spiritual walk in life. So I'm just praying for a real refreshing rain to fall. And I'm praying it starts right with Neil Jeffrey. He's preached about six hours already today. Uh, nobody said he was smart. He's just a good preacher, all right? <laughs> but uh, Neil doesn't need a lot of introduction. We've been talking about him for weeks, and he was here last year with us, so most of you know his, uh, his biographical background. But uh, I guess the greatest thing you could say about Neil, here's a man who loves God. And that's the greatest compliment you can give anybody. Amen. Somebody loves Jesus. So y'all give a, a man's praise the Lord, Brother Neil. Amen. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, it is great to be here. It really is. Good to be uh, be a part of this again, and good to be with you, and good to be with you guys. And I remember you guys fondly from last year, and like I'm kind of shocked uh, I got asked back. Uh, uh, that uh, usually doesn't happen, and, uh, but I'm honored to, honored to be here. And I remember uh, just to, uh, to most of you guys, your faces, and it's just, it's just good to see you. It's good to be here. And... Uh, I, you know, I always feel obligated, and I know you guys heard all this last year, but I always feel obligated to kind of adore, to remind everybody and warn everybody that I, I am a stutterer. Uh, all that really means is that um, I stutter, and uh, I'm, I'm a pretty good stutterer. I, <laughs> I stutter very well, and, uh, you know, I'm always, always uh, sensitive to the groups I speak to, and uh, I spoke to some groups this morning, and I'm just always... Uh, it has to be weird if you're sitting out there and you went here last year and you don't know that, and you just heard that you're a, a speaker for the next uh, hour tonight. And I remember now, ours we're going to go all this weekend is is a stutterer, <laughs> and you're uh, and you're thinking whatever you're thinking. You're 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 feeling sorry for the guy, or you're thinking, oh shoot, why do we have to have the stutterer, or uh, 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 whatever you're thinking. But but uh, let me set your minds at ease that that in one sense being a stutterer. Is, is is no big deal unless you want to say something and 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 so believe me it's going to be a factor and all of my life has been a factor it's affected me in every area of my life as a kid growing up as a student in school as an athlete I mean I, I, I've shared the story I was uh, uh, in high school I couldn't call plays in the huddle and because uh, uh, all you're allowed in the huddle is was 25 seconds to I get a play call and get him on the line of scrimmage, get the ball snapped. And, and of course, uh, uh, 25 seconds and stuttering, just, uh, just uh, often, it didn't want enough time to say all this if I had to do. So we, we were constantly having a situation that I'd be in the huddle calling the play and get stuck and start to stutter. Uh, 25 seconds runs out, referee throws a flag, and we lose five yards, we don't have game. So I'm, I'm costing us some, some serious yardage. And my, my uh, coach, Coach John Davis at Shawnee Mission South High School, over in Park, Kansas, devised a system whereby if I was on the field, I never had to say anything. And we did that in the huddle. We had a split in. He always stood right beside me in the huddle. His name was Steve Thomas. Steve said every play for me in the huddle. He, 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 he'd, he'd say the formation, say the play, say the snap count, and they said, ready, break. So basically, I didn't have to do a thing in the huddle because Steve said everything for me. In fact, in fact, my coach said, Neil, you just be on a knee in the huddle and kind of act like you're doing something. But he said, he said, don't open your mouth because it confuses everybody. So, so Steve said, everything in the huddle, we break the huddle, hustle up in the line of scrimmage. Once we reach the uh, line of scrimmage, I had a fullback. He always lined up right behind me in the eye formation. His name was Stu Cropper. Stu would say all of the huts for me at the line of scrimmage. And it was so unique at the start of every ball game just to watch that initial reaction of the defense when Stu would be saying those huts. Of course, he's in his stance. You can't even see him. And I'd just be smiling. You know, kind of like I got And, of course, nobody knew uh, who was saying those huts or where those huts were coming from. But it's always affected my life. Always had. It uh, affected me all the way through high school. Affected me at, uh, at Baylor. I went to um, Baylor University in 1971 to, to play football. And I get there for that first practice. And I've had a terrible time calling the plays in the huddle. I mean, it was awful. You know, it's a new place, new people. You want to make a good impression. And I'm, I'm I mean, I'm just nervous. I'm uptight. And, I, and I'm stuttering extremely well. And it just uh, created a real scene. Now, what actually made it worse was nobody there knew I stuttered. I had failed to mention that to anybody. And uh, so I'm having a terrible time. And, and it, was a, it was a disaster. I mean, everyone's, it is a one, 
is wondering what's up with this freshman quarterback in Kansas who uh, he can't even talk. And it was, it was just, it was a disaster. Well, after about half of that first practice, Coach Taft, who was our uh, coach at Baylor at the time, great man, great Christian, and just, he saw the situation, saw the impact he was having on all of us, on me and on everybody. So he calls me over on the sideline, and we, uh, we uh, talk about my problem. And I say, Coach, I'm a stutterer. It's not always as bad. Uh, sometimes it's worse. <laughs> we, we, uh, we discussed it. We talked about it. He asked me some questions about stuttering. One of the questions he asked me was, was he asked me if I stuttered when I sang. Because I thought to myself, I said, no, sir, for some reason, I can't explain this, but I can sing without stuttering. He said, no, try this next time. Just try stepping in the huddle and kind of sing a play to the guys. Well, I was only a freshman, and I was uh, desperate. I was trying to step in there uh, as, uh, as soon as it was my, my, my uh, time again. And I was only about 180-pound uh, freshman. And I stepped in there with all these big linemen and these big uh, upperclassmen. just kind of sang them uh, something like uh, slot right X 49 G Y cross X, something like that. And it, 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 uh, it loosened everybody up. And, 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 and it really helped me, and it, it ended up being so much easier to sing the play instead of stuttering through the play. I kept singing the play, and after a while, it was kind of neat and novel, and it, it was kind of fun, and everybody was getting into this thing. And after a while, I started to ask if anybody had any requests. When you hear me <laughs> try to sing the play, too, and I tried to sing it for long. And we stayed over there for several practices, and to one of our centers, Robbie Schultz, uh, I don't know, about, about kind of two or three days later, he walks up to a coach staff after practice and says, Coach, all the guys had decided that we would rather hear him stutter than have to listen to him sing. But, <laughs> but I say all that just so you'll know, hey, uh, I'm a stutterer. Uh, uh, I'm going to stutter, but uh, it's not contagious. You guys, you don't have to worry about it. It's not going to get all over you guys. And, and uh, I just know that, that, uh, that when I get stuck and start to stutter, just wait a minute because uh, eventually something's coming. <laughs> Well, here's what we're going to do this weekend. And uh, uh, we're going to talk about uh, living a life worthy of imitation. Now, of course, every life in some form or fashion is being imitated. I mean, everyone's a leader. Everybody's leading somebody. Uh, um, because, I mean, uh, you could say you're not a role model. And, of course, a lot of role models say, hey, I'm not a role model. But he's a role model. I mean, he, uh, our lives influence others. Uh, what we do has an impact on other people. In fact, some scholars uh, 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 who study this thing estimate that one man's life lived over like 70 years. One man's life actually in some way, big or little, but in some way influences up toward 10,000 people in his life. Uh, people just watching us and making some kind of decision about something based on what they see in us. Uh, 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 that's right. And you know what? A, a, uh, a, a, huge, a huge assignment for a man is to be a leader. And, of course, every man wants to be, you know, her dreams about being a, a leader of men, you know, on the battlefield. I want to be a leader of men or, or in the sports world or in, in, in business. Just have, you know, I want to lead men. Well, that, that's awesome. But, you know, also in a man, a man's assignment it's not just to be a leader of men, it's to be a leader of his wife, leader of his kids. Just a guy who stands up, who just people in his small world where he is, just how he's living his life is making an impact on those around him. And people are seeing him and just observing something and saying, you know what, there's something about that guy. Well, you know, I believe ultimately in the heart of every person, because God made every person, and every person... Someone in there is drawn to know God in some form or fashion, and they, and something inside them which is drawn to know that comes alive when they see a godly man living a godly life. <laughs> there are some great verses in, in, in the deal. I just, I just wanted us to just kind of look at some of the, Look at, uh, uh, we got a, hope you got a Bible. And uh, hope you can look up some stuff because, because uh, I want you to know that, that, uh, that, um, um, so you can look at it and actually see that I'm not making this up, okay? And, and, and it's right in the book. But just, just look, first of all, at, uh, at 1 Corinthians, no, 1 
Uh, Luke 6.40. Just, uh, uh, just, uh, we're going to scan some of these and then, and then get into the deal. Luke 6.40 says this. Uh, Luke 6.40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. Hey, I'm following Jesus. Our point is, and, and we're going to talk about this uh, tonight. This is the actual, actual theme for tonight. But you know, as I, uh, as I pursue him, uh, I'm going to be like him. But also, look at 1 Corinthians 4.16. In fact, Paul is the one who, who, who writes most of this other stuff. 1 Corinthians 6.14. He says this. 1 Corinthians 6.14. He says, um, uh, 1 Corinthians, no, 4.16. <laughs> I'm dyslexic a little bit, too, as well. Um, uh, 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 I got all kind of issues. I mean, I, there's no question. But, but 1 Corinthians 4.16, uh, he says this. You know, um, uh, I'm dysfunctional. That's, um, that's one of the, the things I, I, I best like about me. I know I'm dysfunctional. That's why I know I need Jesus. That's why awesome. I don't get all that cocky. You know why? I know how screwed up I am. I know how easy it, it is for me to get one step away of just doing something stupid. You know what? I love my wife. And I, I'm kind of off track here. But, you know, I love my wife with all of my heart, soul, money. I'm not sure there's a man in the room who loves his wife as much as I love my wife. But, you know, it's amazing how 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 way too often I end up saying something to her I should never say. Doing something I should never do. And just, I mean, this is a godly guy who knows Jesus. He wants to represent him. It's amazing how I can wait too often just do something stupid. Like, I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be, well, I, I'm not sure where I got there. But, but here's, here's uh, 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 1 Corinthians 4, 16. Here's what Paul says. I urge you then, what? You guys be imitators of me. He says, but after this, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, uh, one of the great statements he makes, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, hey, you Corinthians, be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. You follow me, guys. As I follow Christ. Now, obviously, the point is, in the Christian life, you know, um, we aren't following a man, obviously. We're following Jesus. So in one sense, you think, hey, Paul, what do you mean by this? I'm supposed to follow you. You follow Jesus? Well, obviously, the, the ultimate uh, assignment and command is to follow Jesus. But here's the point. We don't get to see Jesus physically. What we follow is a manifestation of Jesus Christ powerfully displayed through the man, a, a, a man who's here among us, like Paul, like a dad who just lives in such a way that he says, hey, son, follow me. And, and, because you know what? Every boy wants to be like his dad. Every boy wants to be like that. And, and, and the fact is, you know what? If that boy wants to be like his dad, if his dad's an alcoholic, chance he's going to be an alcoholic too. Because you know, if that dad is passionately pursuing Jesus, chances are that boy is going to passionately pursue Jesus as well. That's the idea. And it, uh, Paul says, hey, you be imitation. Look at this verse real quick. All these verses have about imitation. Philippians 3.17. Look at this real quick. Uh, we got to hurry. Philippians 3.17. It says, um, Philippians 3.17 says, Brothers, join in imitating me. And keep your eyes on those who walk uh, according to the example you have in us. You know, you know, that's uh, this is Paul saying, "Hey, hey," he's, he's essentially saying, "Hey, man, I found something. It's changed my life. I want it to change your life. You just uh, do what I do. You just follow me." That's what he's saying. Look up this verse, uh, Philippians four nine. This is a great verse. One chapter, one page over in my Bible, Philippians four nine. Here's what he says: What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things and the God of peace will be with you just hey again you follow me you imitate me 
<laughs> All this you, you see me do, you do what I do. You just you just follow me. Here's here, look at this, first first Thessalonians one six. He says essentially the same thing. First Thessalonians just first uh, Thessalonians is is right uh, right before Second Thessalonians. <laughs> uh, right there, just uh, 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 it's right there. In my first First Thessalonians one six says, "And you become imitators of us, and of the Lord, for you've received the word in much affliction with, with the joy of the Holy Spirit." And then one more, Second Thessalonians, right after First Thessalonians, uh, Second Second Thessalonians three nine says basically the same thing. Second Thessalonians. Three nine. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves as an example to imitate. Uh, live in a life worthy of imitation. Now, here's what I'm praying happens happens this weekend. You know, as Pastor said, you know, all of us are someplace. In fact, is I, I barely know you guys, but uh, but uh, obviously I'm the one speaking. But, but obviously, I'm not all that smart. But, um, but God is. And God knows you. He knows everything going on in your life. The good, the bad, the ugly. He knows where you've been, what you've been through. In fact, you ain't done nothing he doesn't know. He knows it all. And, and you know what else I believe? Uh, he, he knows exactly what you need to hear tonight and this weekend. And here's what I'm praying. That God says it. In fact, actually, all I'm asking God to do and, and all I've been praying for him to do uh, is just to give every one of us one thing. I'm talking one honking, powerful thing that we need right now in this moment in order to be the man God has called us to be. Now, you know how you, how you can go to uh, some conferences or you know, some stuff, and it's awesome, it's great, and every speaker's incredible, and you go to that stuff, and you get a uh, hundred things, you know, you're going to do, and you're going to stop doing and start doing, you get all this stuff. Well, you, see, you got so much stuff, you go home, you don't do any of them. I mean, it's overwhelming. It's too much. Well, huh. maybe he's going he's to give everybody a bunch of things, but more than that, I want him to give one, one clear overwhelming, powerful thing, and when you hear that thing, I'm praying at the end of this weekend, on, 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 on Saturday morning, every one of us could stand up and say, hey, this is the thing God had for me. And I'm, I'm, I'm praying as soon as you hear that thing, I mean, it'll be like a two by four hitting you upside the head, and you'll just realize, oh, that was it. That's what I needed to hear. That's what, and, and, and we'll hear it, and realize, hey, it's not just from from me as a preacher, because obviously I'm not that good. <coughs> but the spirit of the living God is. And, and you know what? You think you got a lot of stake in this thing? Hey, God's got a lot of, st uh, a lot of stake in this thing. And he's the one who created you, who died for you. He wants to prosper you and bless you, and not to do harm to you, but to give you a future and a hope. I mean, he wants to do in you and in me abundantly above all that we can ask or even think, even imagine he wants to do it. That's the idea. So we're going to hit, hit uh, one main session, or one main thought, I guess, I guess every session. And here's the first session. Now, uh, uh, first idea is this. If I'm going to be a man worthy of imitation, a man that, that uh, the man that God created me to be, the, the husband that my wife needs for me to be. If I'm going to be the dad my kids desperately need to see and be in their life. If I'm going to be the witness for Christ, the worker in his vineyard. If, if uh, the uh, witness to the world, the, uh, if I'm going to live a life worthy of him, him at quotation, here's some things we've got to do this week and we're going to hit. But here's the first thing. First thing is this idea. Now, none of these things have a real, real neat, cute little uh, outline, and they don't really start with the same, same, same letter and stuff. I have a, 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 a our, um, yes, I'm on staff at uh, a church at Prestonwood, 
at the Babbitt's in Plano, and our, our pastor, uh, Jack Graham, I mean, he, he speaks perfectly. I mean, in the bathroom, he speaks perfectly. I mean, I mean uh, everything he says, it rhymes. I mean, it, it uh, starts with the same letter. I mean, I mean it's unbelievable how he does it. Well, well, I'm not that good. And, and I said, but, but here's, the, uh, 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 the first idea. If a man is going to be that, to, to, to man who, who is living a life worthy of imitation and, and somebody following him, he uh, needs to decide, hey, I am going to have I'm going to pursue a passionate, personal, intimate, powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to passionately pursue that. I'm not just going to have a relation. Uh, no, uh, uh, I'm just not going to accept Jesus as my Savior. I'm going to pat. Now, uh, I'm going to do that. Yes, of course. But I'm going to passionately pursue an intimate, personal, powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to pursue that. You know, uh, you, ask, uh, you ask some guys about their relationship with Jesus Christ, and they always define it in, in, in the idea of, 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 uh, of a quiet time. You ask a guy, hey, man, how are you doing in your, in your relationship with Jesus? Well, I'm, 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 I'm having my quiet time. Or, 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 or well, I'm not having my quiet time. And they define it. Now, there's nothing wrong with the quiet We ought to be having a quiet time. But... To define my relationship with Jesus Christ based on a 15-minute window in my day. I mean, what would happen if someone asked me about my relationship with my wife and I defined it as in a 15-minute segment of time? I mean, it's more than that. It's more than just a quiet time. Somebody says, hey, um, how about your relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, I've, I'm, I've, uh, I'm, I'm reading the Bible. Hey. We ought to be, got to be reading the Bible. But, but it's more than just a book. The book, of course, and, and, and we're going to speak about this uh, this weekend, about being committed to the book, because obviously it's the Word of God. It's inspired. It's like, but you know what? This book speaks about somebody. And what the book speaks about, the book is the menu which points to Jesus. We go to a restaurant, look at the menu, but we don't want the menu. We want the meal. Well, the meal is Jesus Christ. And all the book does is point us to Jesus. Some be, uh, you have some guys about their relationship with Jesus Christ. And they define it. And yes, yes, I've, I've received the gift of eternal life. I'm going to heaven. Hey, uh, that's the bottom line. That's the whole deal. That's, uh, that's what we want to know and have. But a relationship with Jesus is more than just knowing I'm saved. I've got life insurance. I'm going to heaven. It's a relationship. But it's more than just a relationship. It's something that a man decides, you know what? I'm going to passionately pursue an intimate, personal, powerful, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm going to pursue this thing. And um, 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 I'm going to find it. In fact, if I look at me uh, in the Bible, I want to, uh, uh, to show you something. There's, there's, um, look at Genesis chapter 5 real quick. In, in Genesis 5. I want us to, uh, to uh, look at this book. Because uh, this is literally the number one priority in all of life, is knowing Jesus. It's experiencing him. It's, it's having a relationship with him. And, and, and experience him in his fullness. Is what Paul says in Philippians 3.10, which is my lifetime verse. That, hey, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. But, but, uh, but, but let me read this. Genesis chapter 5. Genesis 5. This is a great path. This is actually one of the genealogies of, of, of Genesis. And, and it starts, I'm going to start in just, uh, uh, well, let me start uh, in verse 6. Of course, it, 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 it's about Adam. Uh, in the first five, Adam lived 930 years and he died. Well, well for, let me back, back a bit of that. You know, there's, there's, there's uh, Seth and he, uh, uh, the days of Adam, after he followed Sabbath, 800, he had sons and daughters, and after this, Adam lived 930, and, and he died. 
Seth lived 105 years. He fathered Enosh, and, and, and Seth lived after he, he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters, and all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Uh, Enos lived 90 years, and he fathered Kenan. Uh, Enos lived after he, he fathered uh, Kenan 815 years, had other sons and daughters, and all the days of Enoch were 905 years, and he died. Uh, Kenan, isn't this rich stuff? Isn't this good? And, and Kenan lived 70 years. Uh, 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 he fathered Heliel, and, and Kenan lived after him, fathered Heliel 840 years, and had other sons and daughters, and, he, and all the days of Kenan were 910 years, and he died. Heliel lived 65 years. He fathered Jared, and Heliel lived after he, he fathered Jared 8 and 30 years, had all those sons and daughters, and all the days of, 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 uh, of uh, Mahalia were 9, 8 and 9. Uh, you see a pattern here? All these men were living, getting married, having kids, ha have a main son who's the lion, have another kid, and they're dying. Well, uh, verse 21. No, verse uh, uh, 18. And uh, Jared lived 162 years. He fathered Enoch. And, and Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years, had other sons and daughters. And, and, and all the days of, of Jared were 960 years, and he died. And Enoch lived uh, 65 years, and he had uh, fathered Methuselah, and Enoch. Walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years. That's all the days of Enoch with 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Every man, every man on the plains who ever lived, lives, gets married, has a job, has sons and daughters, spends a life, and dies. But there's more to life. Life is a man being born again, born above spiritually and discovering the reason why he's here, why God created me. What I'm supposed to do is to know him, is to serve him, is to honor him and love my wife, uh, uh, raise my kids, uh, be, uh, be a, a, a man whose, whose life is worthy of him. And, uh, he's holding the way to live. And the challenge is, hey, this is the challenge. I want to passionately pursue an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, uh, you know, the, the idea of passionately pursuing an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, you know, it's, it, it's just not having a relationship with Christ. I'm going to I'm passionately pursue an intimate relationship with Christ. Because some guys, I, I get saved and, and, and they start reading the Bible and they're, um, they're, they're, um, um, their experience is, man, I don't understand it. I mean, doesn't make sense. And they give up. And uh, stop reading the Or they pray and, and realize, you know, after they're praying, hey, nothing happened when I pray, and it just it doesn't work, and, you know, it just, it, it, I give up. Uh, now, you know, there are some things most men are passionate about. And we are so passionate about some things, we're going to pursue those things. And we're going to pursue those things so strongly, in one sense, you can't stop us because we're so passionate about whatever it is, and we're going to pursue it. For example, you know, some guys who play golf, and they love golf, and they got this stupid little slice, uh, 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 that they do, and they can't get rid of that slice. Uh, ugly shot in golf is that, is that little thing right there. I mean, it's awful. I mean, I mean uh, all the big boys go like this most of the time, you know, but, but I mean, ugly thing. And so a guy who loves golf, and he's passionate about showing golf, he doesn't just say, hey, I got this slice and I can't fix it, and he gives up. He's going to fix that problem. He's going to take however much money it costs, get him a coach, get some tapes, but he's going to fix this deal because he's passionately about the game. And he will take no for, you know, some guy's in business. Man, you can't stop a guy in business. Why? Because he loves his job. And, and, and you can say, no, you can't do it. He's coming around because he's passionately in love with his, his work. Most of us have a wife in our life. And we are passionate about our wives. And we want our quiet time with our wives. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, we want to have intimate sexual relations with our wives. And you know what? Just because we ask and she says no doesn't stop us. I'm coming around another way. Why? Because I'm passionately pursuing my wife. That, now, uh, that's the point. It's a man says, hey, 
if this whole thing about God is real, if this whole thing, if Jesus really is who he said he is, and you know what? He can change a man's life. He can make me who he wants me to be. I can become a godly man and live a godly life and make a powerful impact with my life and a splash with, I can do that. But the key is Jesus Christ, not just accepting him as Savior, but I'm going to powerfully pursue a relationship. If I'm praying and it ain't happening, I'm going to find a man who can pray. And as the disciples said to Jesus, hey, Lord, teach us how to pray. Only thing the disciples asked Jesus to teach them was, Lord, we've seen you pray. We've heard you pray. Teach us how to pray like that. If, if I'm reading the Bible and it don't make sense, you know what? There are men who spent their lives studying this thing, who can feed themselves, who can teach us. I've got to find a man. Say, hey, teach me how to read, how to, how to study, how to read, how to memorize, and just, and just be a man of the book. I'm going to passionately pursue. Here, here are three thoughts uh, in, in this whole deal. If I'm going to do that, here's what I've got to decide. You know what? One, there's a fight to knowing Jesus. There's a fight. There's a weight in knowing Jesus. And you know what else is third? There is a reward to that fight. And a reward to that weight. First, there's a fight. How, how do you know Jesus? There's a, there's a, um, a I got to fight against some things to know Christ. And just because there are a bunch of things in me and also around me which are going to rob me of that, want to rob me of that. Look with me, if you will, at, at James chapter 4, real quick. We got to hurry. I don't want to keep you guys too long tonight and, and um, we're doing pretty good uh, James 4 4 I got to fight against some things because there are some things that will rob me of an intimate personal passion relationship with Jesus Christ hey men you know the number one thing God gave us the number one gift God gave a man is his son the Lord Jesus that's the altar. That's the number one. That's God Himself in a man to, to forgive us of all of our junk, clean us up, make us the man He wants us to be. Old things are passed away, everything becomes new. And then He starts doing a work in us that, that we find fulfillment, we find meaning in life, purpose. Reason why I'm here and, and a sense of significance of what I'm doing. That's what he wants to do. You know, that's an, now, obviously every Christian man who, who, who says yes to Jesus has accepted God's greatest gift in his life. The problem is most men never experience the fullness of that relationship and all that God wants that to be in their life. Just like in most men, well, it's about every man marries a woman. Every man shares a bed with a woman. Every man raises a kid with a woman, is married for a lifetime. That may be the second greatest I give God's blessings with. is a woman. But you know it's tragic? Few men, even few Christian men, ever discover the fullness of what God wanted a man and a woman to, to experience and what he describes in Genesis chapter 2 as a one flesh relationship. More than just being married. More than just having intimacy. More than just being connected and being a mom and a dad of kids. It's being one that, that in, in a, a supernatural way magnifies the relationship between God his son and his son and the church. Just a powerful thing. But most men, uh, I never experienced that. Where are some things i got to fight against? Uh, uh, James 4, 4. In fact, here are the four things real quick so you know what they are. They are, they are, uh, um, I forgot. They are, uh, um, uh, they are, uh, oh, oh, yeah, uh, obviously it's right here. I mean, yes, yeah, oh, uh, uh, I got here they are. Loving the world is first. Pride is second. Sin is third. And the fourth one. That I'll mention. 
I mentioned in just a minute. Here's how he says this in, 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 in James 4 4. He, he uh, no, uh, yes, 4 4. Uh, he says, You, adulterous people, uh, James 4, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You know, the fact is, a man wants to passionately pursue Jesus Christ. You know, in the world, there is nothing in the world that's going to affront that man in that relationship with Jesus Christ. The world is against that. In fact, the world has what's known in it as, as the spirit of Antichrist in the world, a spirit which is against Jesus. And we're seeing that, although it's always been here, we're seeing that manifested now in, in these United States of America. As we have essentially never seen it in the history of our nation. That this, and, and just, but there's always been this immorality, this whole thing. If you want to do what the world does, you can have what the world offers, but you will not be the man God's called you to be. You're going to compromise. You're going to settle. And I guarantee you, I can promise you, I can uh, 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 just, just write it down. You, uh, 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 you taste what the world offers. In the end of that, I guarantee you, you're going to end up a place you don't want to be. And, and you're going to feel what you never wanted to feel. And have shame that you never wanted to have and realize I never, how did I get it? I never wanted to be in this place. Because that's the world. It's again, you know, i got to fight against that world. And, and also in me is my own flesh, which with that old nature goes in a tune with the world. And, 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 and there is... No question. There are pressures outside of me that are huge. And there's, there's a passion within me that's huge. You know what I'm saying? But there's also a presence in me that is greater because greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world. But see, what I've got to do is fight against that. Fight against what every other man's looking at. Hey, I'm not going to look at that. What every man is involved in and, 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 and focuses on, I'm not going to focus on that. I'm going to fight against the world which wants me to be only sensual. Now, I want to be sensual. I mean, I want to be, I mean, I mean just being, I, I want to have sex. I mean, no question. And I want a woman. No question. But hey, there's a godly way to have this thing that, that in the end is blessed. God is blessed in, in, in this, when a man has a woman in a godly, Christ-centered relationship like marriage. He's pleased. He's honored. He, but anything other than that, he is dishonored. And the man is dishonored. And the woman is dishonored. And ultimately, society gets all messed up. i got to fight against all that stuff. And, of course, we know that stuff is everywhere. I mean, it dominates. And you know what? Some of us struggle with friends, good guys. No question they're good guys. Love you. But they are not interested in the things of the Lord. They are dominated by the things of this world. And I gotta fight against that. Otherwise I'm not gonna be who God's come. I gotta fight against the world. Everything is and and second, you know I got uh, also gotta fight against? It. It's the whole pride thing. You know what? All of us deal with the pride thing. That that's why he says, Where's my Bible? I got I, I got my notes over there, Bible here, my water there, I'm gonna get I'm all over the place. But here's um, yeah, no, this is Moses. But, but uh, here's what he says. He, uh, uh, he says first uh, uh, about the world. He says secondly, uh, look at verse six. But he gives more uh, grace. Uh, therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You know what? Um, uh, you know it says many, many times. First Peter. Uh, it it says also how how God opposes the proud. Have you ever wondered why God is so, so opposing to the proud, so against the proud? In fact, the word of 1 Peter, that, that God, God opposes, it, it may be the same word here, I haven't really checked it, but he's how, uh, uh, he opposes the proud. That's the idea of an army, of a general, and an army who's standing up, who is coming against that. that and it, it's the idea that God and all of his army so hates pride, uh, um, I, uh, he's against that thing. Everyone wondered why he so uh, opposed that? Because pride is 
the sin of heaven. Pride was the sin of Satan, Lucifer. Long before he became the uh, uh, evil one, the enemy, Satan, the deceiver, uh, and all that bad stuff, he was Lucifer. He was a created thing, a wonderful angel, glorious. But you know, in, in Isaiah 14, or uh, um, Isaiah 7, it, uh, I'm 14, 10 or someplace, um, uh, he rebels against God. And he says, I want to be like the most high God. Why is all this worship going? Him wants to come to me. It's just pride. It wasn't adultery. It wasn't, it wasn't stealing. It wasn't, it, it wasn't using God's name in vain. It was pride. And you know what? When, when God sees pride in a man, it, it, it just smacks of that whole, whole smell of, 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 of that whole ungodly unrighteousness and thing. And you know what? That's one of the things, things all of us struggle with is just pride. And you know what? Uh, it may be blatant. It may be, hey, I don't need God. I can handle God. Maybe something we actually say and actually maybe we're living, or it may be as subtle as, I know I need God, but we live as if we don't need God. I don't have a quiet time. I start my day and just go on my day and never consider God. Only consider God on Sunday when I've got to find my Bible and get the kids and go to church. But... The rest of the day, I'm living almost as if there is no God because I never give him a second thought. Uh, I've got to fight against that pride issue. Uh, third issue, uh, of course, as, uh, as he said, my Bible's over here. As he said in uh, James 4, he says, um, look down at verse, verse uh, um, 8. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. And purify your hearts, you double-minded. Sin gets in the way. I got to fight against the whole sin, uh, sin nature. And then, and then you know what a fourth one is. I got to fight against. Uh, um, it's that phrase right there. Um, draw near to God. And what will happen? He will draw near to you. I got to fight against everything which draws me away from Him. I say I'm going to draw near to Jesus. You know what's amazing? In one sense, the thing, the thing which determines how much of Jesus I'm going to get, how much of this Christianity things I'm going to experience in my life, this real life. In one sense, the thing which determines how much I'm going to get is my willingness to draw near to him. And if I'm not getting it, the only reason I'm not is because I'm not drawn near to him. I'm staying arm's way. That's why I've got to passionately pursue Jesus. For example, you know, uh, personally, I've got to fight against my, my uh, flesh. You know, I know, uh, uh, I know I need to have a quiet time. I know I need to have a cry. And also, I know I need to have one early in the morning. I mean, now, obviously, you don't have to have one early in the morning, but, but, but uh, uh, I think it's the, uh, the time to have it is early in the morning. If you want to have a night, have a night, but also have one early in the morning. But um, I remember when I was at seminary, I, uh, I uh, um, you know, heard about all these great preachers and great missionaries who, you know, who just pray. You got up early in the morning and pray for hours. You know, I remember one guy saying, Somebody, I forgot who it was, Martin Luther or somebody like that, or, or uh, who said, you know, I'm so busy today, I've got to spend three hours in prayer. I mean, uh, and I'm thinking, oh, man, man I'm going to do it. I'm going to be that guy. And, uh, so you know what? I, I try to have no more quiet time. You know, what you, you know what I've learned about myself through the years? I'm essentially never ready to get out of bed. Now, this morning, I was up before 5 o'clock. I had to be, uh, be the traffic in Fort Worth. And every Friday morning, I do our men's deal, which would be tomorrow morning, normally if I was back home. But I'm up at 4.50 because i got to be the church four six, and, and we do our things. Uh, so, so I have to get up. But I've discovered myself. I'm never ready to get out of bed. I can, I can, uh, I can make myself do it, but, you know, if it's 5 o'clock, I'm not ready. If it's 7 o'clock, I'm not ready. It can be 9 o'clock, and hey, 
uh, I can still hang in bed. I mean, I mean, I mean, it's 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 wonderful. It's cozy. It's delightful. Like I would just maybe uh, one time in my life discover how long I could go and, and just not do anything. I mean, I I, I enjoy that. But and you know, I, I remember just uh, just uh, kind of thinking. Uh, you know, one day uh, uh, I'll be sleeping in bed, and and the spirit of the living God is going to wake me up. All of a sudden, I'm just going to wake, be alive. And all of a sudden, I'm going to float out of my bed over to the corner where I have my quiet time. And all of a sudden, I'm going to hear angels singing in the background. It's going to be. I'm going to get. I'm going to pray. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be unbelievable. That's never happened. <laughs> ever. As I've said, i have never, ever ready to get out of bed. Ever. What I enjoy doing is staying up too late, watching ESPN or some ball game that starts late at night, eating something that should be eaten, that shouldn't be eaten. And, and since you go to bed, it's too late. You feel miserable. You wake up the next day, the last thing you want to do is do anything. Well, you know what? A man who spends his life like that never discovers the fullness of what Jesus has for him. So what i got to do is fight against that. That whole flesh, that laziness, that all this thing. And realize, you know what? Hey, I'm getting up in the morning. I'm, excuse me for saying this. I'm getting my ass out of bed. <laughs> Spiritually speaking, of course. <laughs> and I'm getting on my knees. And I'm going to passionately pursue Jesus. I'm going to find out what's in this book that can change my life. I'm going to find. I'm going to passionately pursue, and I'm going to fight against all this stuff. You know, I, uh, I. Uh, well, let me share that in, in in just a minute. But you know, there's a fight to know Christ, and you know what else there is? And there's a weight to know Jesus. You know, in one sense, I can't just treat. Jesus, the way I treat my assistants. I've got a wonderful assistant. Actually, she serves me and another guy. But you know what? She's, she's good. She's efficient. I mean, she's on top of everything. But how I deal with her is I got a busy day, hectic day, crazy things. I got 15 minutes for her. She comes in. I give her all of my stuff. If she got something to tell me, she tells me then, hey, if you got something to tell me, you tell me right now because uh, I'm not going to see the rest of the day. It's, it's, it's a zoo. And see, I got 15 minutes. We got to get it done now, and now it's over. Well, ultimately, I can't treat Jesus like that. Now, here's my point. The fact there's a way to know Christ. You know what? If you got three minutes to give to Jesus, He can fill up three minutes. If you got thirty minutes, He can fill it up. If you got three hours. You want to set aside and seek the Lord. He can fill it up. Have you got three days to stop your whole world and say, you know, I need a word from the Lord. He can fill up three days. You know what? The point is, any size bucket you take to the ocean is going to get filled up. Anything you, uh, you take to Jesus. Now, it doesn't happen right now sometimes. True sometimes. I can have a, a a, a quiet time and I'm on my knees I, I got the posture I got everything and sometimes the flesh overtakes and I, I just sleep through the whole thing and I keep praying I keep falling asleep and I get all oh, the, 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 the truth uh, that's real that happens but that but just because this morning I slept through the whole thing and didn't 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 get it it doesn't mean prayer doesn't work Doesn't mean that there's something not there. So the next morning, I'm pursuing Jesus, as well as pursuing him through the day. I read about one guy, some some black preacher, who said, "You know, I, I started off and I, I got up every morning for 28 days. Nothing happened. It didn't seem like till the 28th day. But the 28th day, heaven came down. Hey, is it worth pursuing Jesus?" If it takes me 28 days, but after 28 days, I experience the reward. 
because there is reward to the fight against all this other stuff. There's reward to the way. You know what the uh, reward is? You get to know Jesus. I discovered early uh, in my Christian life uh, in high school, essentially, late high school, college, even in seminary, I discovered it's pretty easy to make everybody think you're pretty spiritual. It isn't hard to do at all. All you have to do is say certain things. For example, you can say stuff like, man, I, you know, so everyone's around there talking, you can say, man, I had an incredible quiet time this morning. Because everyone goes, whoa. <laughs> now, you may have, I mean, I had a quiet time. But it make, it, you just say it. And everybody goes, whoa. Or you can say stuff, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm and you can say, oh, it was awesome. And, and someone says, well, what are you studying? Well, it's awesome. I'm uh, actually memorizing uh, Deuteronomy. In the Hebrew. Yeah, yeah. Everybody goes, whoa. You know what? I discovered early uh, in my Christian life just what I was doing, which is kind of playing the game and making everybody think I knew Jesus. If I had spent half as much time actually pursuing Jesus as I spent trying to make everybody think I knew Jesus, you know what I would have gotten? I would have actually gotten Jesus. I mean, real, personal, powerful, life-changing. That's the point. I'm going to fight. I'm going to wait as long as it takes. You know, because at the end, I want to know Jesus Christ personally, passionately, and powerfully. So here's the last thing. This is the last thing we're going to do tonight. Look at, uh, at Colossians chapter 1. Here's my Bible right here. Um, and uh, let me see what time it is. Uh, real quick. Ten minutes and we'll be done, okay? Uh, hang with me. Uh, look at Colossians chapter 1 real quick. Okay, Colossians chapter 1. The last thing we're going to do. I'm going to passionately pursue an intimate, personal, intimate, powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. And the end result, you know what the end result of that is? Will be Jesus Christ will be Lord of your life. You'll experience his lordship. And you know what? It'll change your life. And you know what else it'll do? It will change every life your life comes in. That's the beauty of the whole thing. We're going to share this, I think, uh, tomorrow at the second uh, uh, session in the morning, I think. I'm not sure where we're going in, uh, in the morning, but, but I think so. But you know what? It just makes sense if, um, this is what I'm going to say tomorrow, so I probably shouldn't say this, but let me say it anyway. You'll forget about it tomorrow anyway. But, <laughs> but uh, If something supernatural is in the man, something supernatural ought to be coming out of the man. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, obviously, he was God. The world has not been the same since he was here. How he lived, what he did, people he touched. Everybody who touched Jesus or was touched by Jesus was never the same again. In fact, some people just saw him just in his presence, we're never the same again. Everything changed when Jesus Christ was here. Of course, he died. He was crucified. He was buried. He rose again. Then in Acts 2, you know what he did? He sent the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. Now, that same Jesus who was here physically changed the world. Everywhere he went, changed the world. Now, that same Jesus supernaturally is in the man and when the man shows up, changes everything. Not because of the man, because of the Christ in the man. Changes everything that, where that man goes. So a wife gets powerfully changed. Why? Because God's man was there and she was loved by God's man. Kids are changed. Families, churches, communities, society is changed. That, uh, uh, that's the point. I just leave my message for tomorrow on the second session tomorrow morning so uh, so we can skip that one tomorrow okay? we, we don't have to do that tomorrow but but uh, but but here's Colossians 1 yeah we can sleep in tomorrow <laughs> that's what I'm saying yeah. here's here's, what I, here's here's real quick Colossians 1 here's 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 the uh, end result Colossians 1 uh, 15 through 18 this is classically classically known 
as a colossal statement about Jesus in Colossians. It, it, uh, verse 15 through 18. And the end result of this. In fact, every pronoun in this, in this, this passage, uh, every he or every him actually refers to Jesus. So instead of saying he, I'm going to say Jesus instead of he. For example, in uh, verse 15 it says, he is. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. And, and, and Paul's point here, we're going to get to it. In fact, in fact, look at the end of this thing. Uh, verse 18. This is the point. Verse 18. Uh, end of verse 18. That in everything he might be preeminent. That in everything Jesus Christ might come to have first place. That in everything Jesus might be Lord. Number one thing. You know, in one sense, everybody wants to be number one. You know, God... Um, place within us as men a desire to be first. We want to be number one. Our, our, uh, our com com competitive juices just, you know, just, just dominate. And I want to beat you. You want to beat me. I want to win this thing. All that testosterone just fills up and we, we, want, we, want, we want to be first. And the United States of America is known around the world as, hey, we want to be number one. You have say, you have I me mean, all that stuff. Well, you know what? Jesus is consumed with being number one. He wants to be first. And the fact is, the only one who has a right to be first is Jesus. Why? Paul says here, verse 15, because Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now, man was created in the image of God. Jesus wasn't made in the image. He is the image, the exact representation of God. John says no man has seen the Father at any time. Nobody's seen God. The only begotten, the Son, he has declared it. We know what God is like because we've seen Jesus. He's a manifestation of, of, of who God is, and he is God, and he has a right to be first in all things because Jesus is God. That's why he has a right to be first in a man's life because he's God. He also says this, verse 16, for by him or through him, through Jesus, all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible things and invisible things, whether thrones or dominions or ruler or authorities. And, and here's a great phrase. All things were created by him, by Jesus, and all things were created for Jesus, meaning Jesus is, is the agent of all creation. He's the power of all creation. The Bible says, John 1, 3, again, all things were made by him, and without him, Jesus, was not anything made that was made. Everything was made through Jesus Christ. He's the agent, the power of all creation. Uh, he was, everything was made by him, but he's also the purpose of all creation, the goal of all creation. All things were made by him, but all things were made for him, which means men. We were made by Jesus, and we were made for for Jesus. So if a man is living outside of a personal relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ, the man is actually living outside of the reason he was created. That's why life will never make sense. And you can stuff it with all kind of stuff, but in the end, why do some guys, you got everything, blow their brains out? And that's the most bizarre thing in the world. He's got everything. Life to suck in life, but he ain't happy. Why? Uh, he doesn't know God. He wasn't made for stuff. He was made for God. Yeah. And, 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 and life never makes sense. You can't, uh, in fact, like one of the things of, of just sin, tasting of this world, we were made from dust. You know that? Without Jesus in, in a man's life, you know what? You can taste all the, the sweet fruits of this world, and initially they are sweet. But after a while, all those things start tasting like dust. A drink. It's awesome. <laughs> but after a while, it just, just kills the man. Sex. Awesome. Until it dominates a man's life. And all of a sudden, he can't even function anymore. It, it's just all the stuff of life. It's just... It's, uh, 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 that's the way he made us. Uh, everything else outside of Jesus, just at the end, just doesn't taste good. <laughs> but Jesus... As Psalm says, a God, as uh, uh, Psalm, I think it's 34, 8 says, you know, taste the Lord and know that he is good. 
and sweet. We'll, we'll, he said all things were made by him and for him. And then he says this, uh, verse, verse, verse 17, and Jesus is before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together. Everything holds to, to together when a Jesus Christ is Lord. Uh, 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 that it, um, is, is true in the universe. He's holding the universe together. Uh, something's holding this whole thing in place. Has something makes it have, 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 have rhyme and reason. Everything is in order. Everything. Only way we can send a man to the moon and back is because everything has order. You can bet a man's life that this is going to happen in the universe. Why? Because there's a God who's holding the whole thing together. If that is true in the universe, and it is, he's holding it together. God, Jesus is able to hold a man's life together in the midst of a world that just pulls everything apart. He, 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 in him all things hold together. Uh, and he says this in verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. Jesus is the beginning. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead that in everything Jesus might be preeminent, might be first. You know, ultimately, the reason why Jesus has the right to be first in all things is because Jesus is the only one who conquered death. The man's last greatest enemy is death. I don't care who you are, death wins over you unless Jesus is in your life. And if Jesus is in your life, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, death has been conquered because Jesus. In fact, everything that can and will conquer a man's life, sin, temptation, Satan, uh, demon, whatever it is, death, whatever it is, that can and will conquer a man's life has already been conquered by Jesus. That's why he says of us, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And, and, and I'm, I am more than a conqueror, and I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor things past, nor, 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 nor thing, nothing, 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 nothing can separate me from the love of God. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's, um, that's why he's right to be first in all things. I, I was, uh, one story, and I'll be through, and, and uh, we'll go. Because... Uh, I gotta go. You gotta go. We all gotta go. I know. But uh, but uh, you know, I uh, I trusted Jesus as a sophomore in high school. I mean, I, I was um, uh, excited about Christ and excited about serving Him and all that stuff. But but He wasn't uh, the number one thing in my life. Football was the number one thing in my life. Now I would have never have said that. You know, I went to church, and so if you'd have asked me, "Hey Neil, who's number one in your life?" Well, I'm going to say Jesus because that's the right answer. But what dominated my life was sports. Uh, wanted to play football, wanted to be a quarterback, wanted to play at Baylor University. In fact, I, I dreamed about being a quarterback at Broadmoor Junior High, up on Overland Park campus, Shawnee Mission South High School, Baylor University, the NFL. I dreamed. I dreamed, I dreamed about being the the greatest quarterback that ever lived. And that's, I mean, all that, that, that's what I wanted to be. That's what I wanted to do. It dominated my life. Got the best of my life. I was consumed with that. I was, um, I shared the story last week, but, but, but it fits this point uh, so well. I was, I was always, um, if you were raised loving Baylor, you were also raised as I was. Um, one that means uh, uh, we've suffered all, all of my life. But as uh, a Baylor fan, one thing, except for these last few years, been been, been awesome. But, but in fact, in fact, all this stuff happens that's uh, happening now at Baylor. Uh, it's a sign of the end times. <laughs> Jesus is coming back. Let me tell you. But uh, no, no. But uh, but uh, but uh, um, uh, one we saw. But another thing, I always dreamed. Uh, 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 if you were raised loving Baylor as I was, in the fifties and sixties, you were also raised with a real strong dislike for the University of Texas, because Texas dominated Baylor. 17 years in a row, they beat Baylor University. Now, starting in 1957 through 1973, they beat uh, Baylor every year. In, in that span of time, in the 60s, starting like 66 through 73, they won six conference, uh, Southwest Conference championships in a row. Two national championships in 62 and 69. My dream was to play against, at Baylor University and play against the University of Texas. But my freshman year, Texas beats us for the, 
the 15th year in a row, 44 to 7. My sophomore year, they beat us for the 16th year in a row, 17 to 3. My junior year, we played in Austin, Texas. I'm talking Memorial, I'm talking Daryl Ward Memorial Stadium, whatever it is called. I'm talking 87 plus thousand people. Great place to play football. It was a great game. Texas scores in the last second of the game and beats us 56 to 20. <laughs> Seventeenth year in a row. Now I'm a senior. Nineteen seventy-four. We're playing in Waco. We're having a good year this season. Uh, Texas is having another great. They won six championships in a row up to this point. It's a big showdown. They call it on the Brazos River. Our stadium only was about forty-eight thousand people. We jammed about fifty-four thousand people in that place. On the third play of the game, I hit Elsie Jackson to split him on a stop route on the left sideline. He catches the ball. He breaks the tackle. He goes 67 yards for a touchdown. We're ahead seven to nothing. I'm not sure if, if Baylor had even led in 17 years. And here we are ahead. And, and of course, everybody's thinking, maybe this is the year Baylor finally beats Texas. Well, the rules, you know this, the rules are emphatic. If you score, you have to kick the ball to the other team. <laughs> so we kicked the ball to Texas. They're huge. Uh, they ran the wishbone back. They take the ball and they methodically march down the field. They score a seven seven. We get the ball, have a good drive. We get stuff. We got a punt. We punt. Texas takes the ball. They methodically march down the field, score another seven, fourteen to seven. We get the ball, have a good drive. Uh, I throw an interception. As I remember, it uh, wasn't my fault. Uh, <laughs> he ran the wrong route. There's no question. But uh, but uh, but anyway, they get the ball. They score again, twenty one to seven. We get the ball, have a good drive. We get stop. We get a punt. We punt. They take the ball. They march all the way down the field. We finally stop them. They kick a field goal. It's now 24 to 7. Texas is ahead. And uh, it's halftime. Our fans are leaving the stadium by the thousands. And they're all thinking, I'm not going to watch this second half. Well, at the start of the second half, they get the ball first. We stop them. They got a punt. We block their punt. And we go in and we score. We end up, we shut Texas down. They didn't score another point. We end up scoring 27 unanswered points. We end up winning that game 34-24. To this day, it's still the greatest comeback victory in the history of Earth. <laughs> now, now, I may have over that a little bit, but, but for us at Baylor, just, uh, uh, just an incredible victory. And for me, my greatest day is an that. I was the Sports Illustrated Offensive Back of the Week for that game. Greatest experience of my life. I remember being on the field, with just seconds left in the huddle. We got the ball. We're standing in the huddle. I mean, it's over. Just, just run out the clock. I'm thinking to myself, this is the greatest moment of my life. I've been my whole life about doing this, and I'm doing it. In fact, I actually remember having, having two weird thoughts. One thought was, hey, uh, 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 this is all a dream. In a moment, I'm going to wake up in the dorm at Baylor, and then all this is going to be because Because things like that still happen to a guy like me. Then I had a thought, or somehow Texas is going to get the ball and score an 11-point touchdown and beat us because, because there's no way we win this thing. Well, the gun sounds, and only an athlete knows what it's like. You just have one of the greatest victories of your life. Incredible experience. I'm in the locker room just celebrating. Now, late, it, it's late Saturday night. I'm on the way home to the dorm at Baylor, and I remember that our president at Baylor he was actually our um, executive vice president at that time, but it doesn't matter. But he, uh, Dr. Reynolds had always said, if we ever beat Texas, he was going to leave the scoreboard lights on all night long in honor of the victory, and he was going to sleep on the 50-yard line. So I said, I'm going to drive out to the stadium and see if he did that. So I drove out to the stadium. Our stadium is built where the scoreboard is on the south end of the stadium. On the north end, uh, it's been completed now, and, the, and there's a whole complex over there. But, but, but then it, 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 it used to be this big old wall, this big fence. I parked on the north side, climbed up that wall, climbed up that fence, looked across that big old stadium, and sure enough, he had left the scoreboard lights on. And it still said, Baylor 34, Texas 24. And I stood there for it. It seemed like a lifetime, just soaking in the moment of life. Fulfillment of a dream greatest moment of my life. 
It was amazing. As I stood there, I felt something. I'm talking way deep down in my spirit. I felt something. If you've lived long enough, I guarantee it, you have felt this exact same thing. Here's what I felt. Just having lived the greatest moment of my life as an athlete, the feeling was just not enough. It didn't satisfy me. I always thought it would satisfy. It didn't fill me up. As awesome as that glory was, I could already feel it starting to fade, losing it. You know, now it's been 30 years. Nobody even remembers the greatest moment of my life. You know what I realized that night? Football is a great sport, but football makes a lousy God because it can never be enough. It was never meant to be enough. I realized that, that night football could be on my list, but football didn't even be first on my list because football would never be enough, would never satisfy, can't do in me and through me what I basically need for it to do. That's why I affirmed in my life, in a whole new experience in my life, that yes, Jesus, you're in my life, but you're Lord because you always will be enough. You know, um, when a man faces death, when, when I face death, I'm, uh, which ultimately versus men is the ultimate negative, right? Ultimate bad thing. All I need facing death, the ultimate, the worst, He's going to get me. When I close my eyes on this side, the Bible says to be absent from the body. Be present with the Lord. Um, I pray it happens to me like this. Last thing I see on this earth is my wife, Sheila, who loves me like no one else loves me. I love her with all my heart, and I pray I see her. Honey, I love you with all, and I see her on the other side. I close my eyes here, and the next thing I open, the next thing I see is Jesus, the only one who loves me more than Sheila does. Well, I, uh, um, if that's the worst, and all I need is Jesus, you know what the fact is? That Jesus Christ is Lord in a man's life. That's all he needs for anything he faces in life. Because nothing in life is going to be as big, as ugly, as bad as death. You back it up, there ain't nothing I'm going to face here that's anything near what that's going to be. And if Jesus can handle that in me, he can handle anything I'm going to face today. That's why he must be Lord, first of all things. That's why I'm going to pass and pursue an intimate, personal, powerful relationship with Jesus Christ. Because that is the one who's going to change my life and make me the man God wants me to be. That's, that's number one. We'll do number two tomorrow. Okay? Whatever it's going to be. Let's pray. God, I thank you for these men. Thank you for their lives. God, uh, each one is so precious to you. You created them. You fashioned them. Like the Bible says, it, and I don't even understand this, but he orders our steps of all our days. I don't even understand that, but he does. He loves us. He created us. He died for us on the cross. He's got a plan for our life. He wants to do something awesome in us and through us. And it don't matter how much we've screwed up. In fact, and we're going to see this tomorrow. He knew I was going to screw it up. He knew it. That's why he died on the cross. And for me, for you, so I can be forgiven. Lord, I just pray. If there's a man here tonight that's never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, I pray that man would do right now for what I did when I was a sophomore in high school. I didn't understand everything, but I understood enough. I understood I was a sinner, and I needed a Savior. I understood that Jesus is the Savior. He came, he lived a perfect life, born of a virgin, perfect. He was tempted in every way as I am, yet without sin. And then he goes to a cross and dies in my place. He didn't deserve to die. I did, but he died for me, paid the price, shed his blood for my sin. Now I can have forgiveness of sin by trusting in Jesus Christ as Savior, who died, who was buried, who rose again, who's alive, and who will right now step out of heaven and step to any man's heart will ask you in. If you've never done that, why don't you do that right now? Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Actually, it doesn't matter what you say. You say whatever you want to say. If it's real, you can't fake it anyway. 
He knows. He's going to hear. If all you can say is, Lord, save me, that's enough. He can save. He, he can do it. Now I realize most of us in this room, we've trusted Jesus. We know him as Savior. But you know what? It just may be other things in my life have just kind of crept in on the throne of my life. My work kind of dominating me, my, my hobbies, my passions, my whatever it is. Self is kind of ruling the throne of, on the throne of my life. And maybe what I need to do, do right now is confess, Lord, I've got other junk in there. And right now, I'm removing all that stuff, and I'm going to reinstate once again. The only one who has a right to be first in my life, Jesus Christ. I'm going to bow to and obey his lordship. And also, some of us, maybe our prayer needs to be, Lord, I know you're a savior. But Lord, the fact is I'm not passionately pursuing you. I'm not I'm passionately being discipled by somebody and, and passionately studying your word and learning how to pray and doing all the things I know I need to be doing. God, I want to passionately pursue an intimate, personal, intimate, powerful relationship with you as my Savior, Lord. Lord, um, let it be so in our lives. Just teach us. Lord, uh, reveal what needs to be revealed this weekend. Say whatever you want to say to us. Um, just knock us over the head if you need to. But God, you just do it. And God, when we hear, help us to obey and to respond. Do whatever it is you ask us to do. Lord, that's our prayer. That's what we're praying. That's what we're asking in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you. You guys really listened well. You did. I, I, was, I was really impressed. You did a great job. I did. Well, not what's new. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We listen. I won't long. go as long tomorrow. But uh, don't start with a lie. Yeah, I mean, All right. Yeah. <laughs> just keep it. Just just leave it where it is. It's good. Every bit of it was good. There's no apologies needed. Amen. No apologies needed. Amen. <laughs> These guys are used to listening to Tim Strickland preach. All right. <laughs> Praise the Lord, sir. Thank you, God for a good word. Hope he spoke to you. Receive that word. The Bible tells us very clearly in Matthew 13. Jesus said that there's a, the foul of the air, which is Satan, seeks to steal the seed of the Word of God. Don't let him steal that Word now. Embrace it. Go to bed thinking about it. Ask God to clarify it to you. And just let God uh, nurture it through the night even. Wake up with it on your heart and mind.